Okay, so let's continue going on then. How do we determine the cash flows of both investing and financing activities? So cash flows and investing are a three-step analysis. We have to identify the changes in the investment-related accounts. Like we have to explain these changes and then report the cash flows. That's exactly what we've always discussed, right? For the indirect method or the direct method, we just figure out how did it, did it change, how much was it changed, and then explain those changes. So, and this, this is exactly what you'll do in real life. Like I will go, if I'm preparing a statement of cash flows, I'll have a spreadsheet that looks exactly like this and I will see the comparison and I will try to explain the comparison. This is exactly what I'll do. And so I'll go through and look at, here's my balance sheet, 2019, 2018. And I'll say, oh, here's all the changes. Uh, cash increased 5,000 bucks, accounts receivable increased 20,000, et cetera. Here, plant assets increased 40,000. So on the face of it, we can say, we, we might say, oh, we bought $40,000 in plant assets. But not necessarily, it's more complex than that, right? Because there's depreciation related to those plant assets. Um, so it's good that they split it out. So we, so we can know how much depreciation occurred. We see that depreciation went up, which is good to know. And depreciation went up, which makes sense. I've seen depreciation go down because you sell assets sometimes, accumulated depreciation. So be aware of that. And then we might have sold assets, right? So the balance sheet isn't enough. We need to know the behind the scenes information as well. So this analysis, the example here is decent, where it reveals a 40,000 increase of plant assets from 210 to 250 and it increased an accumulated depreciation. But then we'd have to go into our investing books and say, okay, well, what happened? What actually happened here? Well, we increased our plant assets by 60,000. If we look in our books, we say, oh, it actually went up by 60,000 in exchange for a note, which was non-cash. And then we also sold plant assets costing 20,000 for $2,000 cash, resulting in a loss. And we also had depreciation expense entry a more of a depreciation expense entry. And so that the reason our depreciation only went up 12,000 was because we wrote off some of the accumulated depreciation when we sold the item, right? That we debited accumulated depreciation, reducing it, and then increased accumulated depreciation through actual depreciation expense. And so this didn't tell us the full story, not at all. We needed to go in and invest, investigate this matter. And in a true company, it won't just be these transactions, right? Imagine a company like Facebook will have hundreds and thousands of transactions like this. And you'll have each entity will have a statement of what they call a, an asset roll forward a, or a plant property equipment roll forward paper that'll go through all of these and reconcile it back to the books. And so this is a great oversimplification. So if you're looking at this and saying, wow, this seems pretty complex this would probably be one item of thousands of items if you were to get take this as a as a real job right so try not to try to try to realize that you really need to learn this if you want to get into this industry so what do we do then how do we how do we track this on our statement of cash flows so we should reconstruct the t accounts to show the changes in assets so we have the plant assets start at 210 we purchase 60000 and then sold 20,000. And that's how we got to our 250 balance here. And so now we know, right, we can't say that we purchased 40,000 of plant property and equipment. We have to say we actually purchased 60,000 cash flows, uh, cash outflows from investing activity. And then we also have to say, well, we, we sold that, but how much cash did we get from that sale? How much cash did we get from that sale? The cash we actually got from the sale was 2000 The plant assets were worth 20000 on the books, but there was 12000 related to the accumulated depreciation, and we had a loss. Right? So that we only received 2000 in cash for the assets. We, it's exactly what we received for cash, right? That's what's important. Even though we s see a decrease or a sale of 20000 we only have the 2000 in cash. And so, so we ask, well, what happened to these other balances? the depreciation expense and the, the loss. Well, the loss then gets adjusted on the operating activities because losses are short terms. And then the depreciation expense is gonna also adjust on the operating activities because there's a short-term non-cash um, adjustment to net income. 
And so that's how we build our statement of cash flows. That, as we can see, this little piece, 40,000 increase, actually can have a lot embedded in it. And so that's where our critical thinking hats come. That's where our accounting knowledge comes, right? Think after this class, you should be able to go and know more than most people about accounting now. Like anyone who knows a little bit about a balance sheet can say, oh yeah, it looks like we purchased $40,000 in assets. You can go and tell them, no, that, that's not what that means. You could, maybe we sold a million dollars of assets and bought a million dollars of assets in this period. This is not an indicator of what happened. We need to go look where, we're gonna go look at the statement of cash flows. And then now, hey, look, you're a valuable investor. And now if you're going to a company that doesn't have an accountant, you can help them prepare proper financial statements and help assess that information. Now you can think critically. So that, that's where the value is. So what's the key lesson here is we need to, A, identify the changes, which we did step one, explain those changes, and then report on the statement of cash flow. Uh, let me pause there. There's a lot there. Any questions? Does that So let's keep going. Let's talk about financing activities. So a three-step process for term, oh, financing activities, guess what? It's exactly the same, right? We're, all, we're always going to be identifying the changes related to the finance accounts or what are, what are our financing accounts, long-term liabilities and equity. We're gonna figure out, deconstruct it with the T accounts and then report it on the statement of cash flows. So long-term notes payable. Example here is an increased 26,000. Does that mean that we took on additional $26,000 in debt? Not necessarily. Maybe we did, or maybe we retired some debt and took on a larger portion of debt. So cash flows from financing second step. We noticed that, oh, we actually reconstructed some of our debt. Notes with a carrying value of 34,000 were retired for $18,000 cash, resulting in a $16,000 gain. So we had some notes in the marketplace. We were able to exchange them and get a gain on it. Where is that gain shown? That gain is shown on the income statement. It's going to be, uh, uh, right? Because the gain is reported into net income, right? So we're gonna need to adjust the cash statement of cash flows for that net income potentially. But because it's in the income statement, we know there is a component of cash to it. So it should be reflected properly. Uh, so that gain is reflected in our increase or decrease in cash and the net income above. And when we explain it using the indirect method, that would be one of those, uh, uh, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be seeing this in a short-term, long-term, it would need to be reconciled somewhere to depreciation expense. And so we, were, we paid cash of 18,000. So our cash went down 18,000. So our cash paid to retire the notes was 18,000, even though, uh, even though we, it was a $34,000 note, right? And so that's where it would have to build out. That's where we, we need to make sure that we uh, are careful and investigative. But then, since we know that we reconstructed the debt, but we have an increase, we must have issued more long-term notes. Um, and so the, the, we'd have then cash paid retire notes, and then we'd assume that the difference, this increase in long-term notes payable, would then be due to us issuing additional notes. So then, what about common stock transactions? So we see that common stock went up 15,000 bucks, explained through 3,000 shares at $5 per share. It, so there doesn't seem anything too complex here, but it could be a mix, mixture of treasury stock as well, right? So just be careful assessing this, but here it'd be re relatively straightforward. If we just issued stock, then that issuance of stock goes into our cash from financing activities. Why? Because it's part of equity or long-term liability. Same thing with retained earnings. Retained earnings will have our income component, net income. That's already captured though in our operating activities. So what are we worried about? Our dividends. Our dividends because our dividends impact equity. So our dividends are going to be a part of our equity. And so those dividends uh, are going to decrease our retained earnings and we're going to call those cash outflows. And so we'll go through, those are more simple ones, but you can imagine that we'd have to go through each one of these and make sure we understand the nature of each of these transactions. 
So again, they went here and said, we looked at retained earnings from the two, we noticed a change. We explained the change through income and then dividends, and then we report that dividends were a cash outflow. Then lastly, we prove out our cash balances. Increase in cash of 5,000. We make this 12,000 would be our prior year end cash balance, and the current year end cash balance would tie to our current balance sheet. And then you can have a, T, a summary of T accounts explaining all of this as well.